If used carefully, an image slider can be a good way to save screen space for important parts of your website or app. We're going to take an example of the Nike.com product pages and convert the images for a set of shoes into a slider. I'm not necessarily saying this is the best approach in this example, but just to demonstrate how you could do it if you needed to for your own projects. Before we look at the slider, we're going to recreate the Nike.com product page locally so we can then adjust the layout. If you want to follow along with this tutorial, you'll need to get a set of images for your slider, and here I've just grabbed all the assets from the Nike.com product page along with icons from their site. We'll also need an HTML page with a basic document structure which also has a link to a CSS file that has a couple of reset rules already set up, along with some CSS variables to use for our colours. We also have an empty JavaScript file ready for our image slider. We're going to try and whiz through this bit as quickly as possible so we can start looking at how to create our image slider. Let's make a start on the header section of the product page first. The headers actually split into three parts that I've called the top bar, the nav bar and special offers. Let's put the code for the top bar part of the header in first. This consists of the brand icons and the site navigation links. Let's create the styles for the top bar section of the header. Then put the brands in a row and add some space between the two icons. And finally for the links on the right, let's style them adding a separator between each of the items in the unordered list. We'll probably want to remove that last list separator symbol from the list too, so let's add another rule using the last of type pseudo selector. That's the top bar part of the header done, let's move on to the nav bar section which contains the logo, category navigation, search and action buttons. Then we'll add a CSS rule for the overall section, and some styling for the category navigation. For the search bar, we'll set the overall width, height and colour for the parent element and then the icon and input will just sit inside it. To wrap this section up, we'll just set the actions on the end to line up in a row and have some space between them. And the last part of the header is to add the special offers. We'll use the grey background for the special offers and use a box shadow to add a bit of depth to the bottom of the element. We're now ready to move on to the main section of the page. The main section of our product page has two things, the images section on the left and the product information on the right. Let's add the layout for this before filling in the details. Here's the HTML and the CSS. We're nearly at the point where we can add the images and start working on the slider, but let's get sorted with the product information on the right side of the page first. This is going to be split into four sections, product header, product sizes, product purchase, and product description. There is a bit more content on the original page, but the four sections we're going to add will give a fairly similar replication of the original page, and that's good enough for our project. Let's create the product header section first. There's a few things in here including the main product title, the category it fits into and also the price. Now we'll add the styling for this section. Once the product title section is filled out, let's move on to product sizes. This is supposed to represent the sizes of the product that are in stock and you can see we've added a class to some of the list items so we can kind of set them to disabled with our CSS. What we should end up with is a grid of shoe sizes with some of the items indicating that that particular size isn't available. The product purchase section is pretty simple. Just a button which would be used to add the product to a shopping cart. The CSS rule for the button turns it into a big fat rectangle the user can click to purchase the product. The last thing to add in the right column is the product description, which is basically just some information about the shoes. Add a bit of line height to the text for the product description, and this part of the product page is done. Now we can get onto the fun part and start working with the images for our product page and then convert them into an image slider. But how are we going to handle the display of the images so that only one image appears at a time? Well, there are multiple ways of doing this, such as fading one image in and out, but I quite like it when you have the images slide in as if the current image is being pushed out of the way by the next image. We can achieve this by creating two container elements. 
The first will act as a kind of viewport if you like. It will be the size of one of the images and will only show one image at a time. We can do this by ensuring anything that's overflowing the size of this viewport element is hidden. The second container element will have all of the images in a row and we'll just adjust the position of this container to show us each image one by one. We'll change the position of this second element with JavaScript. So that's a bit of an overview of how we're going to make our image slider, let's carry on by setting up our markup. The first thing to do is to get the images on the page, so inside the product images section let's add all of the images. You can see we've created the two containers, the image slider viewport is the view into the inner content which will ensure that we can only see one image at a time. The image slider container element contains all the images we want to show in our slider. At the moment all the images are displaying so let's add the CSS rules for both the viewport and the container. You can see that the key things here are that we've set the viewport to hide any content that overflows and all the images inside the inner container to appear side by side in a row by setting its display to flex. We've also added a transition property to the container so that it will slide smoothly when we start moving its position on the page. That's our slider setup pretty much done, let's have a go at animating it with our JavaScript. So we need to first get set up with the references to the image slider elements on our page. Just some simple query selector calls here to get the viewport and container elements. Also we're going to need to know how many images are in our slider so we've stored that in the number of slider images variable. We'll be using the slide offset variable to keep track of which slide is currently being displayed. We need a way to actually move the slide container on the page and we might want to do this either automatically on a timer or when the user clicks a button. Let's create a JavaScript function that can move the image slider container element. We'll create an arrow function called move slides that adjusts the position of the slider image container based on the offset value provided as an argument. To move the slider image container we adjust its transform CSS property by subtracting the result of the provided offset value multiplied by the width of one single image. Here we've calculated the width of an image by getting the offset width property of one of the images inside the slider container and it's important to keep getting this value every time the move slides function is called as the browser size and therefore the size of the images might change over time. If we try calling this function from the browser console you can see we should be able to move through the different images in our slider simply by providing a different offset argument each time. Obviously we're not expecting users to do this though so let's set up a timer that will move the slides for us automatically. The way to set up a timer in JavaScript is to use the setInterval function which will call another function, the first argument, every so many milliseconds, the second argument, forever. We're going to create an interval that runs every 2000 milliseconds which is every 2 seconds and we'll call the move slides function we previously created. Of course we need to update the slide offset before we call the move slides function and we've set up a little bit of logic to take us back to the start of the set of images if we go over the slider images length value. We should find now when the page loads the slides are now being moved automatically every 2 seconds. And if we wait until we get to the very last slide, we'll see it takes us back to the very first slide and starts all over again. So there's our image slider setup and because the JavaScript code looks at how many images are inside the slider, we don't need to worry about changing the code if more images are added into the HTML. This kind of automatic slider is great if we don't need the user to have any control over the movement of the slides, but on a product page such as ours, we might want to give the user the ability to change the slides to view different images themselves. So to try and make our slider even better, let's take a look at giving the user control over which slide they're viewing. We need to add some buttons or something for the user to click so they can control which slide is being viewed. Let's head back over to our HTML and add another section to the image slider. Here we've added an additional section, image slider navigation, to our image slider which has two buttons that have a couple of SVG icons I've grabbed from heroicons.com. We need to get this navigation element to sit on top of the slider and the images so we'll set its position to absolute and push it into the middle of the slider. For the buttons themselves, we'll set their position to absolute as well and give them a fixed width and height. Then just place them at each edge of the image slider respectively. So those navigation buttons are appearing where we want them to now but we need to set up some event listeners to detect when a user clicks on them. Back over in our JavaScript, let's get a reference to both of the buttons. 
Then let's attach an event listener to each button, which first of all updates the slider offset variable to point to the relevant image and then call the move slides function. We should find now that when we click on one of the navigation buttons, we can change the slide going either back and forth through the available images. But you might notice a problem with the slides sliding twice or fighting against each other. This of course is because we've still got that automatic timer in the background which is working away, progressing through the slides every two seconds, which might mean the slider offset variable gets updated by the user and then immediately updated again by the timer, kind of fighting against each other. One way to remedy this would be to remove the timer when the user's mouse hovers over the image slider, like when they're about to click one of the navigation buttons, and then restart the timer when the mouse is no longer over the slider. In our JavaScript, let's set up a variable timer which will hold a reference to the timer for the slides and create a function which stores the result of the setInterval function in that timer variable. We also make a call to the setTimer function we've just created and the page should appear and behave exactly as it was before. But now that we've got access to the timer variable, we can stop the slides from updating by clearing the interval and restart the slides by calling the setTimer function again. Let's set up a couple of event listeners for this. So when the user's mouse is hovering over the slider, we'll stop the slides by clearing the interval stored in the timer variable, and when the mouse moves away from the slider, we set the timer going again. Now when we take a look at our image slider, the slides are automatically updating, but when the mouse moves over the images, they stop updating. This allows us to navigate forwards and backwards through the slides without having a fight with the timer. And once we're done, moving the mouse out of the slider triggers the other event listener which sets the timer going again. Notice how the slider remembers what position in the slideshow we're at because we have the slide offset variable which is available in both the timer interval and the navigation event listeners. So I quite like the navigation buttons we've created for our image slider here, but how would they work if we needed to get data that wasn't on our page, like from an API for example? Well, we'd need some way of fetching the data on each button press and ensuring it's available before putting it on our page, and if that's something you're interested in learning about, then check out this next tutorial where we're going to be making a JavaScript quote app which will fetch a random quote from an API and display it to the user.